Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. The last week in particular, although it goes back quite a ways farther, probably farther than most people realize, but the last week or so in particular has been a very bad week for the Alberta NDP. And it's been a bad week because people are starting to step forward expressing concerns about how the the party central deals with constituencies, deals with members, and how they play the system in order to get the results that they want. Now, it's really important to highlight this isn't new. Back before the 2019 election, we saw MLA Robin Luff actually removed from caucus because she raised concerns about bullying and the way that the NDP was doing business. And if the conversation that we're going to have today and over the next few episodes are any indication, nothing has changed. Today, we're being joined by somebody who was a constituency president for the NDP. They were also an aspiring candidate for the NDP, but the NDP seems to have moved some pieces around to make sure that they got the candidate that they really wanted. We're going to have that conversation today to try to figure out if that's actually what happened. So we're joined today and we're very grateful to be joined today by Krista Lee. Krista, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Happy to chat. So to start with, before we get into the the dumpster fire that we're, we're seeing raging, um, who is Krista Lee? Let's start with that. So, uh, yeah, who am I? Um, I became involved with the Alberta NDP um, in 2018 to 2020. Um, in 2019, I had emailed the previous constituency association here in Calgary, Bo, and said, you know what, um, I just moved to Calgary the year or so before. Um, I was pretty progressive. Um, I'd like to be involved. And I didn't really get any any response. And so I felt that, well, maybe, maybe there isn't an active CA. I didn't really know much. Um, and so moving forward with that, uh, I became very outspoken here about the lack of a high school in West Calgary. Um, I became pretty vocal about the state of public education in Alberta. And I, through that, got in touch with some other progressive voices who lived in my community who said, hey, you know, maybe you would be interested in resurrecting the CA. Um, it's kind of defunct. Um, maybe we can get together and, you know, you could be a part of that. And so that's how I got involved, bought a membership. Um, ran for election at the um, meeting and I became the president of that CA. Um, and so right away, uh, right away, um, I have to say that I, I have served like on, been involved in politics back in Newfoundland where I'm from ever since I was able to walk. Um, but I've never been the president of anything like that. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was, I was very proud that um, we could do this, that we could get to build this now there, you know, we, we had had a previous CA and they had done their work. Um, but we we now get to put our stamp on this and we get to build and, and move forward. And so we were very excited with that prospect. What I learned, however, is that um, the long arm of the party is a very long arm and that, you know, CAs are, are not we, we don't actually have as much flexibility as most members seem to think we we do. And so right away it was sort of, OK, great, I'm here. We're ready to go. Now, what do we do? There wasn't there wasn't a lot of uh, onboarding. There wasn't a lot of. Um, here's how this works. It was like we, for example, we never once saw an organizational chart. So I couldn't tell you who's employed by the party. I couldn't tell you to whom they report to. Uh, we knew the key staffers. We knew who to contact if we needed data. We knew who to contact if we needed help with fundraising. But we never knew who was who. Um, we had an organizer who helped with all of that. We were never given a list that said, hey, congratulations, here are all of your other associates across the province that you can connect and team build and work and community build. We found these people surreptitiously. So we connected with other constituency associations or I connected with them surreptitiously, we found them on social media or came across them in mass, mass emails. And um, so people seem to think, like I wanna be very clear, people seem to think that constituency associations were all this big happy bunch and we're all connected, we all know one another we're actually quite in isolation from one another, right? And I think party does that um, to keep us in our little boxes so that we don't get time to organize and we don't get time to, to, to plot and scheme, I suppose, and to prevent what just happened with the letter that came out signed by 15 CA presidents. So that's how I, I got involved. That's how I got into it. Okay. And when did you decide to step forward to be a candidate? Um, probably like close to, close to a year into it. Um, I spoke with an MLA, um, and had a good conversation with her and, 
you know, she was an MLA who also had small children, um, talked about the work-life balance. Um, you know, I, I just worried about whether or not that was tenable, uh, commuting back and forth from Calgary, whatnot. And so I decided that, yes, I would put my name forward and that I would give it a go. And so I submitted in March, um, and, uh, to this day, uh, to this day, so March 2022 would have been at 12 months, of, like 12 months waiting on a word back. Um, I never actually was officially rejected or accepted as a candidate. So I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. You put in all the required stuffs to have the NDP vet you as a candidate. And oh, it took them more than 12 months to not get back to you. So, yes. So I submitted. So what happened was I applied for a nomination package and, and the person that I had to apply to to get that package was Garrett Spalesi. And so um, Garrett is the nomination process um, there. He is the process. And, and in a way, this makes him a bit of a kingmaker within the NDP. I'll be really blunt about that. And um, I think that that's sad. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way, but he is the nomination process. And so I applied and he got back to me and gave me the package and I went through it and filled it in as best I could. I had some questions uh, that were clarified. And then I had a meeting one-on-one -on -one with Garrett. Um, and so what I was told during that meeting was that to be prepared to fight for it, that nobody in the province of Alberta as an NDP candidate would be given a free ride and that every single riding would be contested, every single one. And so I felt like, okay, then that's fair. Then that's a healthy, healthy democracy. And if that's what we have to do, then that's what we have to do. And like, I'm not anybody special. I don't expect a free ride, sir. So happy to fight like anybody else would. I submitted, I waited. Um, it took them weeks to respond to my email asking if they had even received it. Um, and so finally they tell me that yes, they have received my package um, and that just stay put and things will be ticking along. Um, I emailed Garrett fairly regularly to ask for progress as to what was happening, where this was going. Um, and I was just told, yep, yeah, be patient. And finally, I was told, you have a prolific social media presence. Um, okay. And you are very expensive to put through the vetting process because we have to read through all of your stuff. Um, there are people out there with far more prolific social media presences than I could ever hope to achieve. Um, so fair enough, fair enough. They have to go over all of this with a fine tooth comb. I, I, I get that. Um, silence, right? So all of this time I'm sitting here wondering about, okay, how do we rejig our family? What is this going to mean for us? When do we get started? Like how you understand that when you are waiting for word as to whether or not you're going to be accepted to be a candidate, like that is psychologically very powerful. Right? Like you are kept in a holding position for so long. And finally, I just sort of got the feeling that they're, they're not betting me. Like this, this isn't happening. And um, it became clear to me that I was a tool to shovel some shit here in Calgary Bow. And um, I was not going to get through that process. I just sort of had that gut feeling. So finally, I reached out um, probably in January and said, listen, uh, I volunteer with another board. <laughs> I have to give them my intent as to whether or not I'm returning. Um, and this will, I can't, I can't do these things simultaneously. You have to tell me where I stand here. And so I was told, yeah, uh, we're going to schedule you a candidate meeting. So um, prior to this, the party did come out and say that they were going to spend a million dollars on vetting, right? So there would be a million dollars spend on vetting. There would be staff hired, there'd be a third party, things were going to be clearing up. But people that I had spoken to who had also submitted nomination packages were still waiting 10 months, 11 months, 14 months um, in the vet. So what, what was happening? Like things weren't, this backlog wasn't dissipating. The people who gave me my interview were Jeremy Nole and Sandra Houston. Um, I had a 40 minute interview and it was, it was a very interesting interview. Um, you know, one of the questions that I was asked in that interview was whether or not I had any connection to communism or the communist party. And my husband is from mainland China. Um, his parents suffered terribly under communism. Um, it was, it was an incredibly insensitive question. And I responded, 
with humor and said in that interview, no, Senator McCarthy, I've never been now or ever have been a communist. And I think that glib response should have been taken as indicative of where my headspace was with that. Um, in thinking about that actually makes me very emotional. It's an incredibly insensitive question to ask, just incredibly insensitive. And, you know, we all sort of ha 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 on to the next part. Another thing that came up in that interview were comments that I had made um, in what I thought to be a confidential president's chat or like a Facebook messenger group for all CA presidents that Brandon Stevens, who was the um, party secretary, was also a part of. And I, I'm beginning to think that his role in that chat was to was to act as surveillance because my comments about party messaging were brought up to me. Um, I had said that, you know, if party is going to be putting up messaging, it would really behoove them to speak to constituency association presidents. Um, you know, here in Calgary, the messaging that you're putting out isn't matching up with what we're hearing on the doors. And so we can we can tell you what the issues are. We can tell you in what neighborhoods we're hearing these issues. You know, this is rich data. Why don't you want it? And um, I was asked about my loyalty. You know, could I could I tow a line if the messaging from party was one thing? Um, would I? you know, would I be able to silence my own voice and go along with that? And like red flag number two, um, you know, when you are elected, you're elected by your constituents. You are elected to serve your constituents. You are not necessarily elected to serve solely the party. Um, that's problematic. That's, that's, that to me was problematic. So we had a cordial interview. Um, the interview concluded and I was told I'd hear back in a week or two. And I never heard, heard formally um, what, what the response to that was. So I, I, I resigned, clearly. Um, I resigned from my membership and said, you know, basically you can stop this whole process. Um, and the only acknowledgement I received from that was, okay, we will shred your application, thank you very much. And, um, and that was, those were the words used, we will shred your application. Um, and so no formal, like I was not a rejected candidate, but I was also not an accepted candidate. I want to make that clear because people say, well, you're just bitter because you were rejected. I was not rejected. I wasn't also accepted. I was left in limbo for more than a year. And I think that like, as you were talking there, I, I, I couldn't help but look <laughs> because if, if one of the comments and one of the reasons for your uh, candidacy being delayed for a year was your prolific social media presence, um, just looking at your Twitter profile, you have 12.5 thousand tweets in the, the history of your account. Um, Drew Farrell has 55,000. So I would imagine it would take five times longer to, to vet her social media just based on her Twitter feed alone. And yet she was vetted and approved in what can, what one can only assume is a timely manner, because if it takes a year to do 12.5 K, presumably it would take five years, which would mean, boy, Drew's had this plan for a while. I can't comment on that. I mean, yeah, I can't. I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know, right? And the other. I mean, of course. I mean, yes, it riles me too. But what can you do? I mean, here's the thing in this though. Like this nomination process is set up. There is one person running the nomination process. To whom do I complain? The provincial secretary of the party, who is his literal best pal. Do I complain to the president of the party? To whom do I complain? I don't know the organizational structure of the party. So who is his superior, right? What's the chain of command? So it's sort of, um, you're like, you're just, there's nothing you can do, only bend over. And so, okay, then it is what it is. Um, the other thing that was brought up to me too was that I had a previous old uh, Twitter account that I deleted um, and started up a new account. And there were some concerns that, you know, I had, was hiding this or hiding that and they couldn't see the account. and. I was asked if I could go back and retrieve it. And I was like, no, it's a deleted account, people. Like I can't, I can't drag that back through time, but I'm very happy to stand by what I know about myself and say that if there was anything that you needed to know, I would be very forthcoming in bringing that to you. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know why I would not have passed the vet, um, but again, I wasn't also denied the vet, right? Like. So I, I am interesting because party would like to, to tell people or would like people to believe that I am bitter, I'm a rejected candidate. I, and then Brandon Stevens yesterday makes the comment that, you know, well, anybody can appeal uh, a rejection. You can't appeal a rejection, my pal, if you're not rejected.
So let's go back a little bit just before you resigned, because it, if, if I'm getting the timeline right, and this is where I'm going to really ask you to correct me, the an announcement that uh, Drew Farrell had been accepted as a candidate and was going to be running in Calgary Bow came as a bit of a surprise, not only to you, but to your constituency association. So can you kind of walk us through that? So we were completely blindsided. Um, and that maybe that's not actually the best terminology to use. I'm sorry. We were, we were completely um, taken aback. We were completely, completely taken aback. So um, what happened is this. When I told Garrett Spalessi that I wanted a nomination package and that I was seeking the candidacy, I was told, well, you are the president of the CA, so here's what you need to do. You have to set up a separate nomination committee. You can't have access um, you know, to that, and you can't be a part of it, and you have to stay out of it. And I said, absolutely, I will preserve the integrity of that. And our constituency association did form a separate nomination committee. I did not attend any of those meetings. I was not privy to what went on there. They actually, if you go back to Calgary Bow social media, made some public posts said, hey, we're seeking a candidate. Um, you know, if you are interested, please apply by this timeline. Two people submitted packages. One was me, one was Diana Batten, who is now the candidate in Acadia. Now, to be clear, we did not find out that she was going to be moving to Acadia until we saw her social media post. So she didn't withdraw from, or she didn't notify the constituency association that she was withdrawing? She, no, no. So, but she did follow the rules and notify us in writing that she had applied to seek the candidacy. I did that because there is an actual form in the nomination package that you have to fill out to send to the constituency association that says, hi, I'm seeking the nomination. The form is in the package. I took that to be, this is something I have to fill out and send in. I understood it that way. Diana Batten understood it that way. Um, Drew Farrell didn't submit anything to our constituency association, nothing, um, absolutely nothing. Garrett Spalessi told me in no uncertain terms that I had to notify my constituency association in writing, anybody did. And so to be clear, two candidates followed that path. I did, Diana Batten did. So um, to our knowledge, we had two candidates seeking the nomination in Calgary Bow, and we were fully prepared for that. So imagine our surprise when we, uh, I woke up on, on the Monday morning, it was a holiday Monday, and my phone is like, Krista, did you see, did you see Twitter? Oh my God, Drew Farrell is running in Bow. What's going on? Did you know this? Um, and then the, the, the CA people are sort of in the group chat are sort of like, you know, holy fuck, we're being steamrolled. Like, what's going on? Did you know this? Who, who, who decided this? Like, what is going on? So uh, one of our CA people who had access to the email, I didn't, went in um, and saw an email that was timestamped at like, I think nine minutes after midnight on the Sunday before a holiday Monday saying, congratulations, uh, Drew Farrell is seeking the candidacy in Calgary Bow. Now, that does not preclude anybody else from seeking the candidacy. It just means that she's already been vetted. She's through. She has the leg up. So understand that the minute that, that she can declare that she wants to seek that candidacy, that she's been a vetted and approved candidate um, or vetted and approved to seek that candidacy, she is a nominee, right? But technically at that point, there was nobody else who had been vetted. So she was not necessarily a nominee. <laughs> For all intents and purposes, she was heading towards being acclaimed, right? Um, so I hadn't been formally rejected or accepted. Diana Batten, we saw on Twitter, had been shuffled off to Calgary Acadia. Um, so we were sort of like, what's going on? What is happening? Um, if I'm really honest, and if I... If I speak frankly, I think it was a huge middle finger to RCA to act in that manner, to send an email that basically winks at the rules because the CA has to be notified that a candidate has been approved. Um, but it's basically sort of a, you know, I can do what I like here. Who is going to come at me, right? And so um, we, we were absolutely in disarray and the, you know, the people on the CA, we met very quickly and it was decided that we will have no part of this. We will have no part of this process. Two other candidates followed the rules set out in that nomination package. Um, one candidate didn't. One candidate seems to have gotten by us, like not by us, but, but was dropped out of the sky to us. And which begs us to question, you know, 
why would you want to run in our writing if you don't even want to work with us as a CA? If you didn't feel that you could even tell us that you wanted to seek the nomination, why do you even want to run here? So it was sort of a we're done and the CA walked away, at, you know, was, was ready to walk away at that point. And then, then officially we, we resigned and we were done. Um, then I saw Garrett, you know, spouting off about this on Twitter and I actually called him and said, it's time we have a conversation here, buddy. Um, it's time to have a conversation. And it was an incendiary conversation. It was an explosive conversation. It was, um, it was wild. It was wild. Um, and I said to him at the time, and of course it, I can only tell you my side of it. He may have a different interpretation of it and that's fair. Um, and I would welcome him to tell his side of it. Um, I said, you know, that was not decent, nor was it classy, right? Like, and he said, well, you were informed. And I said, yeah, we were informed at nine minutes past midnight on a Sunday before holiday Monday, pal. Um, that's just not nice. And it's, it's not kind. And he said, it's not my job to be any of those things. It's not my job to be any of those things. Now, I just want to, can I just jump in for a quick sec? Because I just want to do a little point of, of clarification. Um, you're saying 12.09 on the Sunday before the holiday, Monday. So is that Sunday morning or is that technically 12.09 Monday? Morning? Nine, minutes, nine minutes after midnight. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we found out basically at midnight on Sunday. Okay, so less than less than less than nine hours before she announced. Yeah, okay. and when we saw the announcement, there's a snazzy video. It's all done. I mean, clearly it had been done for some time. Um, so all of this was going on, and I mean, it was lovely. It was well done, and you know, great. We we have someone who wants to to run in our writing. That's super. And yes, she'll be a great candidate. I have every you know every confidence. I don't know her. I've never spoken with her. We've never had an interaction. So all the best to you. Um, but hey, that wasn't done really well. Um, you know, why, why, why do that? What I fear, what I suspect, um, and this is again, just, just my conjecture is that, you know, I think she was perhaps told, don't worry about the CA, we've got them under control. And so I think party was surprised that we weren't going to tow that line. And, um, it just goes to show how, how little they know the people who are out there doing the work for them, because that isn't a fair, I mean, it's, an, it's hard to say it's not a fair process. It's not a nice process. It's not a nice process, you know? Um, we just want it to be treated respectfully. Uh, we're not looking for favoritism. I didn't think that I should be the candidate just because I'm sitting on the CA. That's wrong and it's rude. Um, that's, that's not the thought here. But you could be respectful to us. All of that could have been avoided by a phone call that says, hi, um, we're just calling to let you know that we vetted a candidate for you folks and this candidate will be announcing. And so we just wanted to give you the heads up. But instead, we were sent a really shitty email very, very late the night before, less than nine hours before the announcement came. Um, you know, how do you not take that personally? How do you not see that as an absolute and total abuse of power and, and just sheer arrogance? And I guess, I mean... I the question that comes to mind for me immediately is it, it seems like on some level they must have been aware that they were potentially playing a, a bit of a, a, let's go with disingenuous game perhaps, um, because if they... If they had believed that the CA would have no problems with Drew Farrell being dropped in, despite not having been notified, or they could have even notified you earlier, um, then, I mean, there's no reason not to notify you guys. But it, it almost seems like they knew that they, they had to skirt the letter of the law um, for some strategic reason that I'd not Well, Gar Garrett, Garrett said to me, technique. Technically, you were notified. Technically, I suppose we were. Technically. From what you know of the NDP and, and your expectations of the NDP, is skirting on technicalities part of the culture that you expect from them? Doesn't surprise me. Okay. I, well, that, that forces me to ask the follow-up. Is this the first time you've seen it? Um, I think, I think it's, it's a little kept secret that the NDP is not run by its membership, right? The NDP is run by really just a couple of staffers. 
and a lot of decision-making power with very little accountability is held in their hands. So again, if you look at the nomination process and you know, when we look at that letter that was put forward by 15 CA presidents, like as a former CA president, I can corroborate every single point in that letter. I can tell you that everything said there is an absolute valid point. I saw it with my own two eyes. It is, it is a very, very valid letter. And so I think there's sort of this idea that as the person, I can do as I choose. Like, who's going to stop me? These people? Hardly, right? Like, who? to whom do we complain? To whom do we say this process stinks? And when we, when we say that, you know, are we not then, well, you're just bitter about it. You're just bitter. And well, you know what? It's already done now. There's not much we can do. So, you know, it's, yeah, it, I'm not surprised, I guess is what I'm, I'm not surprised. Now, the, the obvious question that I have to ask is, you know, you say, who, who do you complain to? And I mean, you started this process when Drew Farrell announced that was back in February. We saw the constituency associations, those, those, those 15 people from constituency associations and sign a letter, uh, I believe it was in March, I could be wrong, uh, to the party saying, hey, we got a problem here. Um, I guess the obvious question is, given the persona that we see projected on social media uh, about grassroots and here for you, where's Rachel? You know, I've come to realize through this process that I'm probably more of a CCFer than I am an NDPer. And I signed up for the party of Tommy Douglas. And I, I keep saying that, right? Like I signed up for grassroots, but this isn't grassroots. There is a lot of central control and central party, you know, in that letter, which, which isn't an airing of the grievances, by the way, it is, I think, an absolute gift to party because it says, hi, we've identified the problems for you, my friends. Not only have we identified the problems for you, but we have done the work in solution finding. So we have also put forward solutions, tangible, doable, bare minimum solutions to these problems. It's, it's here for you. That should be respected as the gift that it is, not treat it with hostility. So when I, I don't know, I mean, I, I kind of feel that what has happened with the NDP is that we have become less of a grassroots party and more of a brand. And I kind of felt looking back on this, that we were really treated almost as brand ambassadors, more so than actual grassroots volunteers. You know, in my resignation letter, I said that it is important that party has to remember that we are the ones doing the door knocking. We are the ones putting our hand out asking for money. We are the ones phone banking. We are the ones, you know, handling very sensitive personal data through Populous, the NDP's, um, you know, data data database, whatever. Um, we are the ones who are giving up a lot of family time to do this for zero dollars with zero reward except building a better province. So um, it, is, it is not okay to do things like this. And this isn't like, this isn't the first instance, right? Like people have come to, come to think that, well, you're just a voice in the wilderness. I am absolutely not a voice in the wilderness. Right. As you said at the beginning of this, this goes back to 2018 when Robin Laff left caucus over allegations of bullying. The NDP at that time put a very big pot lid on two MLAs who were sitting, who were accused of sexual assault. And that was locked down like nobody's business. And I don't think we are remembering these things. Like we are so terrified of the UCP and so terrified of, you know, these, these absolute, you know, soulless ghouls winning another term of government that we um, are willing to just be, be nice about it. I don't have a vendetta against the NDP. I don't have an ax to grind. In fact, I would be very, very, very willing and very happy to give a lot of my time to help fixing some of these problems and, you know, putting some of these solutions forward. Because I think, I think it's valid. I think, you know, I think the party has a bright future. I think it has, a, has policy that's really important. I think there's room for growth. If you're gonna be a left party, be a left party. So, you know, listen to your grassroots. and. My sense was that the grassroots was, you know, 
we were meant to deliver sacks of money to the party. We were meant to fundraise and we were meant to do the grunt. And then we were meant to be quiet because we, we could not be trusted by party to run their agenda. And there was a lot of that. The party just didn't trust us. And the words used to me when I said to Garrett Spalessi very clearly what I asked, you know, why couldn't you have just told us that we had an applicate application and that it was Drew Farrell? And he said, because you're not trustworthy enough. And that was an incredibly personal insult. It was an egregious thing for him to say, because at the end of the day, I'm the signatory on our bank account, right? I can be trusted to sign checks. I can be trusted with the personal voting data, um, information, personal addresses, all of that stuff who had a lawn sign through populist for hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, I had federal populist access, so across the country, I could be trusted with that. I had to sign an NDA, do all of the things. I could be trusted with that. I could be trusted to fundraise. I could be trusted to go talk to people on the doors, but I couldn't be trusted to handle an application to my constituency association. I handled Diana Batten's application. Why couldn't I be trusted with this? So, you know, that's abusive, right? It, it, is, it is abusive. It is arrogant. And this is not the first time. Like this, this is not the first time that allegations have been made. Um, party knows, party knows. And if you think for a minute that, you know, Rachel Notley doesn't know that this is happening. Rachel knows, and she has to know. She's the leader of the party, right? She sits on our executive council. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't have any ill will, not at all. In fact, I think that this is. Um, I, at the beginning, you said that this was a bad week uh, for the NDP, and yeah, it's a shitty week. But honestly, I think this could be a very, very good week for the NDP because here are people telling you, listen, we care enough about this party to come out of our comfort zones and put ourselves out there in a very very vulnerable way to speak our truths because we care that much about this party and about building this party into something better and, and, and building this party into something that could become, um, you know, our government in 2023. So why treat that with hostility? Why come up with it? There's two sides to every story. Um, you know, why not say, you know what? I think we've jumped, jumped the shark. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna dig into this. We're, we're gonna dig into this. You know, it should not take 30 days. It should not, or should not take 90 days uh, for that letter to, to, get a, to get a response. I mean, party is just very, very lucky that it didn't surface before now. And I think what needs to happen is a change in the mentality of how party views itself, right? Like central party needs to step away from this mentality that is 1981 and we're running this party in the basement of the United Church somewhere. Like we formed a government we can do big things. We're capable of a lot, but we need a back end that meets up with the front end. We can't have two guys running the show. We need to have processes in place, processes for vetting, processes for nominations, you know, processes for communication. It should not take a month to have an email responded to. If you're a CA president and you're emailing for information and you need assistance, you're emailing Garrett or you're emailing Brandon Stevens, it should not take an average reply time of three weeks. Like it's the biggest joke, 21 days later, right? Like that's that's when you get a response. And so CA presidents, we, we talk about this. We all know it. It's just that, you know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. So yes, it's been a bad week. Does it have to stay bad? No, no, it doesn't. And I think, again, the NDP would be wise to reach out to, to people who are talking and say, all right, you know what? Come in, come in. Let's do this together. Let's rejig. Let's talk. Let's rebuild. Because you know what? This is serious. Shit's getting real. And we want all hands on board here. Instead of batting down the hatches and trying to protect people who frankly aren't, aren't worthy of that protection. We've seen certainly in the media, uh, social media and traditional media, that the NDP has taken a approach or elements of the NDP, I should say, seem to have taken an approach that is trying to minimize the situation, make it go away, um, and um, quibble on technicalities as opposed to the soul of what the actual problem is. How much faith do you have, if any, that the NDP will, or that, that Rachel Notley will, take these concerns seriously and work to address them? I think what we're seeing from some of the senior staffers that I've mentioned is ass covering 101. And I think there are, there are MLAs who are just now finding out that this has happened because that letter didn't go to MLAs, remember, it went to executive council. 
it didn't go to every MLA. Um, it's not like suddenly everybody knew that this was a thing, right? And I think that there are people in the party now who are sort of going, how long has this been going on? How long has this been going on? Why? Why have we not heard about this? What is happening? So there's an element of surprise. I would expect that when anybody is given an given a letter like that, or when allegations are, are made like mine, that there is an element of, no, we can't be like that. I mean, you know, I've had it said, and others who have made allegations have had it said, well, you're just, you know, the Greens have put you up to this. Um, you know what, the only, <laughs> my salad doesn't talk to me. So, um, so stop that. No, like, why is it more tenable to believe that a conspiracy theory, theory is more, you know, it's more viable than believing that the NDP is capable of some, of some funk? So we have to be critical of ourselves. Am I, am I optimistic that, you know, things are going to change? Cautiously so. But Nate, this has been going on for so, so, so long. I mean, when I first made my post back in February about resigning, um, you know, one of the things that happened immediately was I suddenly became a dumping ground for everybody who had a story to tell. I mean, former staffers, former MLAs, um, former organizers, former candidates, people who were in vetting, who were the same as me. I mean, it was just, just dozens, literally dozens of mostly women who had a story to tell about the process or who had a story to tell about Garrett Spilesi. And so the NDP know this, you know, like this, this isn't new, this, this isn't new. And for them to, to, to say that, well, suddenly like, we have no idea, um, that's wrong. And they, and they, and I don't think that they will do that. I think that, that the president of our party, Peggy Wright, is somebody that I have a tremendous amount of faith in. Um, she has always acted with integrity and is a very genuine person. And any interaction that I've, I've ever had with Peggy has been um, tremendously warm and friendly. And I think she is somebody who in her core being embodies, you know, NDP values. So I have a lot of faith in, in Peggy um, as our president. But who sits on our executive council? Because they're the ones investigating this. And so we have people investigating themselves, right? So this is why any of this needs to be taken out of there and made independent. And that's one of the um, solutions that's put forward in the letter um, that was signed by the 15 CAs was that this needs to be independent. Um, you know, we can't have the provincial secretary investigating the provincial secretary. We can't have, you know, um, members in direct conflict of interest, I think, sitting on the executive council. And there are several who are in direct, direct conflict of interest here, um, you know, sitting in on this. This, this has to be, this has to be done and it has to be done correctly so that we're not in this position again in three years time. So that there is not another Robin Luff there's not another Krista Lee. There's not another, you know, Sherry Valentine. Um, you know, we, we shouldn't have to, to get to the point where we become whistleblowers. That, that's not fair. And party will point out and say, we have a harassment policy. And, you know, that's interesting because where is that harassment policy? How does that function? How many, how many cases have ever been resolved through that? Because we were, we were you know, we, we were asked to use that policy um, and we did. And to this day, we're not sure of the outcome of, of what happened with it. And we're like, what, two years into it. So, um, you know, that harassment policy came about because of some very big allegations against the NDP about abuse. We know that, right? So, okay. Um, but who investigates the claims through that process? Like, there's no transparency whatsoever. So who, who's doing the investigating? Um, um, you know, what are, what are the possible outcomes? And is this known to the membership? Like, is this something that everybody knows? This is a one-stop shop, click here, and this is this is how you report harassment, or this is how your complaints are dealt with. So there are some problems. I think Rachel Notley was correct to, a, to an extent in saying that, hey, there are some growing pains. She's, she's absolutely right. There are some growing pains. But we've had growing pains since 2015. It's 2022 now. Um, that's kind of no longer viable as an excuse. And she's not wrong. Like there have been some serious growing pains with this party. I mean, we were a party literally operating, as I said, out of church basements, but we formed a government. We know how this works. So there has to be some impetus. That's where that's that's part of where I kind of struggle with the growing pains line, because if, if you're going to say uh, we've got some growing pains, 
we were government three years ago and we have to, I mean, the implication is we didn't learn anything about any of these topics in our four years of government. We didn't build any strategies within the four years of government. So we're still pretty much we're starting from scratch from 2019. And that's in and of itself some scary implications. But I don't want to get weighed down in that. I have one other thing that I really want to get your thoughts on, because I think this is at and you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but I think it's at the crux of why this is so important. Since you and others have started raising concerns about some of these things, one of the knee-jerk reactions has been, we can't talk about this because we have to beat the UCP. And it seems to me that if we start to, if anybody, I'm not a member of the NDP, so anybody, starts to accept... Um, the the notion that we should overlook bad things in order to stop the people who are worse. Not only does that l present a very real possibility of eventually you're going to become that worse thing, but it also doesn't allow for any sort of forward growth. Because if, if we don't draw, the, to me, if we don't draw the lines on, in the sand, hey, this is not okay. This is not where we, who we are. This is not who, where we stand for. If we don't draw those lines and say, that's a hill. We're going to die on it if we have to. Then it just allows the situation to get worse. And I'd really like to hear, when, when you see people saying that kind of stuff on social media, A, what's your reaction? How does it make you feel? Um, it's really hurtful. Um, it's really hurtful because I spent a lot of time building the CA here in Bow. Um, sorry. It's, it's, it's incredibly minimizing. You're telling women who have been dealt with in a very abusive manner by very abusive staffers that they just need to be quiet and take one for the team so that we just need to win. And once we win, we'll figure it out. I don't think we can win if we continue to, 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 to put our rot in a bucket and carry it with us. So at some point we have to deal with the trash. Um, you know, we can't just, just keep piling up garbage in our suitcases and carrying it along. Like we have to deal with this. Um, I also want to say too that, you know, as NDPers, we have to remember our core values and what, what we really believe in. And is it, is it worth it to operate like this? Is it really? Um, you know, at the end of the day, the bulk of my experience with the Alberta NDP was extremely positive. You know, I met incredible people. And I will say this, and I have said this to anybody who has an ear, um, the organizers who are working for that party are absolutely to be commended. They are paid garbage. Um, they are, they work incredibly long hours. They are completely undervalued and they are treated in the same manner as many CAs are treated by some of these staffers, um, not very kindly. You know, the, the organizer that we worked with in Bo was an absolute tank of a human, an absolute hero who went to bat for us and who helped us and who stood up for us at every corner. And um, I have tremendous respect for that individual, um, tremendous respect. But it hurts me to my core to hear people say, well, you just want to tear down the NDP, Krista, because you're vindictive. And I know that party is spinning that narrative. I, you know, I, I've seen screenshots of what's been, what's been shared amongst party loyalists and it's, you know, I'm not to be spoken to and don't engage with her social media. And, you know, I am officially the pariah of the outer darkness and um, it's lonely out here in the outer darkness, but I think a lot of these people are missing the point, right? Like you have been, been given people who care so much about the party and who care so much about progressive values that they are willing to subject themselves to a lot of criticism and put themselves out there very publicly um, not everybody would do that. There are people who just say, you know what, shag this, I'm out. They pack up their, their stuff and they, they go that way. Um, I don't hold any position with the NDP right now. I'm not even a member and I'm not willing to be a member until a few things happen, until an independent, an independent investigation happens, until the solutions that are outlined in that letter, frankly, need to be put in place. And until Garrett Spalessi is no longer employed by the Alberta NDP. When, do, when those things can be done, when there is some sort of consensus that we are ready to fix these problems and that we we truly want to be a grassroots party, I am here for the building. Uh, call me up. I would love to help. But in the meantime, I don't want to be part of this. It's it's toxic. It's not nice. Um, and I guess maybe at the end of the day, you know, I'm not ruthless enough for this. Perhaps I'm not. But I care about my province very deeply. 
Um, Alberta is my, not my home province, it's my adopted province. We moved out here in 2006 and it's home to us. It's given us two lovely children. Um, I believe deeply in Calgary Bow. I care very, very deeply about my community. And so it's very hurtful um, to, be, to be made out to be a pariah for speaking my truth. Before I let you go, is there anything else that you'd like people to hear? I think, I think people just need to understand that, you know, what you, what you see on the outside isn't what's on the inside. And that when people on the inside start to talk, you know, somebody said on Twitter that, you know, the party should know to never let staffers be the story. And um, this is the result of what happens when you start, when you, when you swept stuff under the rug for so long, is that you just run out of rug. And I think the party has run out of rug. All right. Well, Krista, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you so much for, um, and I mean, I think it has to be acknowledged. It is, it is an extremely difficult thing to, to speak out publicly on just, even anything, really. But when it's something that is as close to your heart as this clearly is, um, that requires a, a whole lot of character, requires a whole lot of bravery. And I think that, that it's, it's important that it's acknowledged. And for what it's worth, when I see people who are trying to, to say, none of this matters because we have to stop the UCP, that is only further indicative to me of how much the plot has been lost. So thank you again for taking the time to chat with us today. No problem. Thanks so much, Nate. As always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here at The Breakdown, we would love it if you swung by our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash thebreakdownab and signed up for a small monthly sponsorship of the work that we're trying to do here. It is because of the support that we receive from our Patreon sponsors that we're able to continually up our game, and it is tremendously appreciated. So I want to throw a big thank you out to them. And you can go ahead and visit that website and join and support us as well because we need all the help we can get. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of these important conversations. And we will see you next time on The Breakdown.